If you come in with quite a strong opinion about both the royal family and about their, their role in the 1930s and 1940s, you're going to come across a lot of vested interests. And obviously, there's a lot of older royal historians who have made a very comfortable living for years, peddling things that aren't com completely true. And if you come in and try and shake it up a bit, you're going to meet a certain degree of resistance. But that's great fun. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Aspects of History podcast. My name's Oliver Webcarter and I'm the editor and your host. I'm shaking things up a little bit today, so there's a double interview session as old friend of the show and royal historian Tessa Dunlop and I chat with Alexander Larman, who has written an explosive new book on the Windsors during World War II. As you heard at the top there, Alex's book has ruffled a few feathers amongst the Union of Royal Writers, and he documents the Duke and Duchess of Windsor's flirtations with the Nazis the aftermath of the abdication, and George VI's transformation from a nervous, stuttering spare into a king who gained the admiration of the nation during the war. We recorded this before the coronation, so please forgive me for that, but it makes for a fascinating chat. Uh, Alex's book is a hugely compelling read. Coming up next week, I've got Gordon Corrigan talking the Battle of Waterloo on the anniversary. Then it's Peter Taylor on The Troubles. The film club continues with Paul Greengrass's Bloody Sunday. And as another bonus, I've got a recording of aspects of history out in the field. Flanders Field. As I went cycling around World War I sites. For those Canadian listeners, I have a treat for you. Until then, I'll hand you over to Tessa Dunlop and myself speaking to Alexander Larman. Alexander Larman, welcome. Great to have you on. Thanks for joining me. And of course, to Tessa too. And so just before we started recording, you mentioned you've been having a few, well, I, I guess ruffling a few feathers. Is this sort of professional jealousy? Uh, no, it's not. It's not that. And how best to put it tactfully, if you, if you actually wanted to use this in anything, it's that if you come in with quite a strong opinion about both the royal family and about their, their role in the 1930s and 1940s, you're going to come across a lot of vested interests. And obviously, there's a lot of older royal historians who have made a very comfortable living for years, peddling things that aren't com completely true. And if you come in and try and shake it up a bit, you're going to meet a certain degree of resistance. But that's great fun. Could you explain what they're resisting? Well, what I've found is that I've never been a sort of a royal obsessive. I've never come into this to be somebody who's going to be, you know, oh, God save the Queen and all that stuff. I come into it as a as a historian, as somebody who's looking at people in the royal family the same way as I looked at, say, Lord Byron or, or Lord Rochester. I'm not really interested in the idea that you take somebody because they happen to be king or queen and treat them as a kind of quasi-divine figure. But I've begun to realise that, oh, no, 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 you've got to be respectful. I think, no, no. History is not supposed to be a respectful discipline. It's supposed to be a discipline where you investigate, when you actually get into what's going on. It's not supposed to be you just saying, oh, God bless us, everyone. So, no, I'm not very interested in sucking up to people. It's never really been what I do. When you start writing about these vested interests, and it sounds like, you, you know, you, you're saying you're, you're less popular or becoming unpopular. Do you get do you get sort of accosted in, in um, I'm sure you're often at drinks parties and, and soirees and such like, do you get do you get accosted by these vested interests? It hasn't happened yet, but it's going to one of these days. Because what's quite strange is there's at least one man who he seems to have a slight obsession with me. And I, I had oh. a, a review of I well, I mean one tries, but I had my book reviewed on I think the Times or the Sunday Times. And not only did he make a point of going onto the comments section and saying that there was clearly nothing new in my book, but then he attacked me on social media a couple of weeks afterwards, and I thought the best one in the world, perhaps you could get a life. I mean, perhaps you could stop talking to strangers and perhaps you could actually engage in your own discipline and write better books. I mean, that might help. The trouble is now, and I'm sure you find this, Tessa, is that right, but becoming a royal historian in 2023 is a very different discipline to what it was like in the 1980s or the 1990s because people want something different out of royal history. And I think that the trick is not to look at it in terms of a pageantry and in terms of essentially being a PR man or PR woman for an industry, but instead to take on a new, more analytical approach. And it, it helps if you don't have deeply held monarchist beliefs, because if you sit down, as I think a lot of the older royal historians do, and essentially take the attitude that you have to respect the institution at all costs, then I think you're coming up against a problem that is a bit like writing a biography of somebody and the notes you get from your editor or your author or your publisher is, this biography has to be a flattering biography. And you think, well, no, it doesn't. 
the whole point of investigating a life or a series of lives is to take an analytical and neutral perspective. Now, for me, I mean, the fascinating character that I've written about in The Crowning Crisis and Windsor War, it's the Duke of Windsor, because he is so flawed and he is so loathsome in so many regards. But you've got to look at him completely afresh. And actually, I mean, I think with a couple of exceptions, nobody would try and defend him, because ultimately he is a man completely eaten up with selfishness and with in, in consideration for his fellow man. And I think that what I'm going to hopefully do, and I'm, I've just finished writing a third book, which is going to be you know, the last of the Windsor's trilogy, Power and Glory. Hopefully, if you read all three books back to back, you would have, because that's, you know, over a quarter of a million words, a lot of them about this completely flawed figure. I hope you get, essentially, a substantial biographical account in a way that nobody could have done 20 or 30 years ago. Alex, I suppose my slight issue with the Duke of Windsor is that he was also treated quite badly, just on a human level. He fell in love with the wrong woman. I know he had a penchant for doing that. I know he was indulged. He was spoiled. He was ridiculous. That's being a product of monarchy. But he, he had this monogamous devotion to Wallace and he was cast aside. I mean, we see how damaging it is even in today's much softer way to exclude Harry by his own volition. Indeed, he's self-excluded. And there was the Duke of Windsor. I don't think he ever imagined he'd have to give up the crown. And we realise that retrospectively he really misses it because all the flummery that he denounced when he was in line for the throne, he suddenly adopts retrospectively, doesn't he? I mean, everyone sort of has to call his wife HRH and bow and scrape. Well, that's what he'd like, but it doesn't happen. And I mean, it's quite interesting for, you know, because at times, I mean, what's been very interesting writing all these books is that you're moving between different genres. I mean, there's, in The Crowning Crisis, I mean, I, I pitched it and wrote it as a kind of ticking clock suspense thriller, but there's also a very large chunk of social commentary in it. And indeed, you know, comedy, because you can see the way in which Edward's expectations as king are not remotely matched by those around him. But with Windsor's at War, in a sense, it is, as the title implies, it's a war book. But then it's also a conspiracy thriller, because Edward, when he left of not office, but when he left the throne and stopped being king, he was somebody who essentially was he was adrift. And because he wanted people who would suck up to him, he went out looking for people who would unequivocally give him that kind of support and that kind of adoration. And unfortunately, it turned out to be Hitler and the Nazi party, which is, I think, that what we can say is that while the Duke of Windsor may not have been a Nazi himself, he very much enjoyed their company and he very much got something out sort of hanging around with people who kept telling him how brilliant he was. That's just and he always used... Ollie loves it when I'm nice to him. Why? <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I can't say the other way. Otherwise, I'm going to sound like some kind of masochist. The as for Duke, as for Duke of Windsor was, I mean, perhaps indeed. you should have got an Edward and Wallace relationship going on. It'd be really fun if you did. <laughs> but should we, um, Wallace? Shouldn't we? Shouldn't we thank the heavens that Wallace appeared and therefore he couldn't become king? Well, he did become king. <laughs> well, he, he abdicated. Yeah. Um, well, it's an old coward line, isn't it? There should have been a statue of Wallace Simpson erected in every town and village in Britain in order to thank her for what the service that she did in getting an obviously unsuitable man off the throne. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think that he was the worst king since probably George IV, if not earlier. And the fact is, is that he was awful because it actually quite, he was quite like George IV. And it's an analogy that various people have made, that he was completely selfish. He was completely unsuited to being king. And all he wanted to do was further his own interests. And I think there's quite a lot of parallels between, you know, the legendary Mrs. Fitzherbert and George and his Prince Regent and Edward and Wallace. Because what you can see is in both cases, it's a man who's put his own personal happiness far, far above any kind of duty. And of course, the idea of duty as regards the monarchy is, I think, a fascinating one, because we see George VI as somebody who's completely dutiful and who saw everything that he did had to be within the context of the throne and of maintaining the monarchy. And then, of course, we see the Duke of Windsor who didn't. But I mean, what becomes fascinating is that he was always demanding that Wallace be referred to as HRH. And of course, this would never be officially sanctioned. She didn't care that much. I mean, to her, it didn't really mean anything. But to him... It was absolutely essential that she prefer be referred to as HRH. And I did some digging because I was trying to work out why does he care so much about this? And it transpired that he was worried about her being snubbed at dinner parties. You think that's quite extraordinary, really, isn't it? <laughs> well, he is this hugely shallow figure, isn't he? Yeah. I mean, there's not. The thing is, is that, I mean, 
Alan Lascelles, his private secretary, said of him, you know, essentially it's like looking into a, a pool of shallow water. There's nothing there. I wonder, just forgive the modern parallel, but that kind of obsession with the Sussexes using their titles, is that then Harry driven or is it Meghan driven? Can you find a parallel? It's very interesting because I keep being asked for my opinions on Harry and Meghan, and I don't have any opinions on Harry and Meghan. I mean, I will happily give you what you know I know about them, and I will happily trot out you know the old canard over and over again. But fact is, is that he's obviously very stupid, and she's very manipulative. I mean, that's, there's not a lot more to say than that. But fact is, is that because they are these figures who have these parallels between Edward and Wallace, then obviously you do think is history repeating itself. Now, it's very easy to blame the woman, isn't it? It's very easy, as people have always done with Wallace Simpson, to say she was a manipulative so-and-so, she put him in this position. I don't think that's entirely true. I think that he was the one who was responsible for all of it. Now, Harry, I mean, not much fair, is there? And what I want to know is where it's going. I mean, can he continue to be a celebrity when he's somebody who basically the only thing that he's well known for is being a former member of the royal family? I mean, is that enough to sustain fame? I mean, it probably is these days. I mean, it wasn't quite enough for the Duke of Windsor, was it? He always didn't feel he had enough money, and I don't understand why not. I mean, it, a, a lot of that wartime, <laughs> we're thinking of the Nazis in the war, but the Duke of Windsor's thinking about how much money he's managing to pull out of Britain. Yeah, and it was it was quite complex because there was a point after the Second World War he didn't he literally didn't have any money because all of his money was kept in France and currency restrictions were that he couldn't remove it, which is in large part why he started to, to, to sell those confidences and did his memoirs and stuff like that. I mean, it's fascinating when you can see that he was a man who was obsessed by money. But then I suppose if you have led all your life and you have you know a level of lifestyle, a standard of living that you're very used to, I and mean, then it's taken from you, but for you, your own auspices and, and your own fault, what happens next? I mean, what do you do subsequently? And I suppose that understanding his psyche is basically he was a boy who never grew up. He, he was Peter Pan. And it was the way in which he never... Because it's, it's interesting, actually, because Wallace and her first husband, Ernest, who corresponded after Wallace's marriage to Edward, they referred to the Duke of Windsor as Peter Pan. And I think there is that element to him. But who's who, who's Captain Hook? I mean, was it Tommy Lassels? Was George VI? Was it somebody else altogether? I mean, who's his nemesis? And it's the freeloading aspect as well that in, in reading your book. I, 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 this is the thing that always gets me um, about many of the royals, even contemporary ones, I think, have, have that reputation, don't they? What I find very interesting about the contemporary royal family is there's a great deal of attention paid to, you know, the civil list and who gets what and the fact that King Charles is saying that he's going to slim it down so it's only the core working roles, blah, blah, blah. That's not what I think anyone would object to. I think what people object to more is there's an enormous sense of noblesse oblige going on, which is levelled not just towards the people who go and open the hospitals and go and cut ribbons and go and charity functions or the rest of it. It's the fact that there's huge numbers of people who are just out there using these names and using these associations essentially to... F I mean, it's like I saw that Princess Eugenie was talking at Davos the other day and I thought... She would not be talking at Davos if the word princess wasn't before her name. No. And it's things I like that. It's that kind of... So it's a, it's a kind of soft power that the royal family has had, which you could see as being a benevolent thing. But when you look at Prince Andrew and his disgusting sense of entitlement, and you also look at the fact that he has somehow managed to avoid criminal prosecution, and you think, why has he avoided criminal prosecution? And it's much the same thing with Duke of Windsor. I mean, I say explicitly in Windsor War, if he and Wallace had not been royal, he would have been in prison for his actions during the Second World War. I mean, there's no doubt about that. I mean, can you, can closely... you cite exactly what what you think he'd have been prison for? When was it? Yes, when he I mean, was what... being in liaison with the Spanish and stuff? Was it that yes, point in 1940? Yes. yes. Yes, 100%. I mean, that was treason. I mean, what he was doing out in Spain and Portugal was by any definition of any term in the Second World War treason. And if Mosley and Diana Mitford could be imprisoned, so should he and Wallace have been. The fact they were sent off to the Bahamas instead, which was a punishment. I mean, let's not beat about the bush. It was definitely something that was done to punish them, to show them that they couldn't behave like this, and to get them out of the way. That was a far less embarrassing way of dealing with them than putting them in jail. But he was kind of hedging his bets, wasn't he? In in in, I mean, you know, he was trying to work out which way the wind was blowing. I suppose because he wasn't one hundred percent being British, that therefore is treasonable. Yes, precisely. I mean, that is treason. Mm. I mean, if you sit down and you're a British citizen, you say, "Well, 
I'll flirt with the enemy a bit, see how that goes. I mean, that is the definition of treason, isn't it? <laughs> so yeah, yeah, he should he, he should have been in prison. And it's it's a fascinating thing that he wasn't. But then, as I said, no member of the royal family has ever been put in prison or has ever faced criminal charges. So make of that what you will. Uh, you're, oh, you're, obviously you're, Charles I. <laughs> indeed. Your, your book opens in September 1940 with the bombing of Buckingham Palace. And it occurred to me the great what if what if George VI had been killed in that bombing? Would we have seen a regency of Edward VIII returning to be regent? Or what What, what would have happened? Because obviously Princess Elizabeth was, uh, was a child. Well, I mean, the, the question is at this stage, was there any appetite for bringing the Duke of Windsor back? And of course, if you'd said to the general public the tragic death of George VI has meant that we must bring back this established figure who's already been king once, that would have probably met with a certain degree of public sympathy, and I think he would have found it quite easy to have come back in those circumstances. But there's, of course, one massive problem with this. I mean, he just spent the last few months hanging out with the Nazis and essentially being very, very tempted to do things which were treasonable and, you know, may or may not have included his actually giving them information that the Germans then used to bomb Buckingham Palace with. So I think there's a lot of people, including Winston Churchill, the then Prime Minister, who would have thought the idea of Edward's return, even in the event of his brother's death, would have been not just undesirable, but actually impossible. The question is, who would have been, I mean, is it possible that the Duke of Kent would have been regent for a couple of years until Elizabeth became of age? I doubt it. Would the, you know, the, would, would the other one, the Prince, would the Duke of Gloucester, Duke of Gloucester. would he, would, Duke of Gloucester? I mean, no, I mean, he was useless. I mean, in fact, one of the things I've always found funny is that you look at the various royal brothers and they're all flawed in different ways. But the Duke of Gloucester's for one, I find endlessly funny because whenever he does something, it's usually going to be incompetent. And of course, his family knew he was incompetent. I mean, it's a fact that the Duke of Windsor and Wallace referred to him as the unknown soldier. And I just find that really amusing. I'm so terrified right. of talking over Ollie that there's this like really long Me pause there going on forever. I know. They so have some <laughs> pin, Pinterest pauses, and I feel like, have I just said something completely stupid? No, completely it, it's or, just I don't, or want to, both. I don't want to trample. I don't want to trample on his masculinity. You take it away, Ollie. It's your pod. Go for it. Oh. Oh, it is. Yes. Well, Tessa. Uh, <laughs> the other, the uh, the other question I had for you was that um, we well, we've mentioned uh, Harry and and Meghan. Yes. Yes, we have. This vacuous existence that the Duke and Duchess of Windsor had post-war, it becomes increasingly... I, they seem to just have less and less of a... Um, the, the, their marriage is a really unusual one. And I know you've touched on Harry and Meghan today. I just wonder, Harry doesn't have a plan because, as we've discussed, he doesn't seem to be capable of formulating a plan. Is he just, I mean, Netflix documentaries can't go on forever. They can. That's the awful thing. They actually can. I mean, he's because he's, what, 39 now, 38? No, he's slightly younger than that, isn't he? I think yeah, he could do this. 40, isn't he? Yeah, I think he could do this for the rest of his life. I mean, I, I genuinely believe that if if he wanted to, he could be this constant figure in the media, always popping up, always on hand to... because. To, his father's not going to go on forever, so when William becomes king, he will be like the Duke of Windsor was. He'll be somebody who's lent on, especially by American television and American media, somebody who's always on the hand to denounce his brother or say so provocative. Now, heaven knows if his marriage is going to last, because she knows that she has a vastly more successful media career without him now, that she, is, she has to have her own brand, which is not her husband's brand. So she'll be considering that, and she'll be thinking to herself, well what's in it for me. But if we come mm. back to him, I mean, yes, I think, unfortunately, because, I mean, I thought after the Queen died, there was a serious chance that republicanism was going to make any kind of comeback in this country. The thing that stopped any kind of republican movement was that line to see the Queen lying, lying in state. I don't know who came up with that idea, but it was the best idea that the royal family have had in decades. Because what it did was it showed the world very clearly exactly the veneration in which the Queen was held. And so that, immediately, when you have, a, 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 you know, a visual statement of that kind of power, mm. there's no possibility yeah. that you can actually argue that republicanism has any kind of place in Britain. But, 
It's so interesting you should say that. I've been doing these little TikToks and I said to Ollie, well, I, I did one on uh, Was Prince Philip Faithful and it went down really well. And I said, well, I really want to do one on Did the Queen Have an Affair? But I just know that I can't do that because it would be seen as you so can. inappropriate. But then who's it inappropriate for? I mean, Indeed. I I mean, get even though I would, so, so this, I would... This is interesting. I, wait a minute. I would conclude... Think... No, I don't, I don't know how to do this talking thing online when we talk over each other. Oh, come on. So, but do you think that she did have an affair? Because Prince Philip almost certainly did. Yeah, Prince Philip, I, I'm, I'm almost certainly did. And I think that was the whole idea of the yeah. tolerant marriage. But yeah. um, the Queen, funnily enough, this whole thing around Porchy, Porchy's a, a case in point. On the VE Day night, when she goes out and has that moment, you know, that she's not sort of trapped in the palace or, or the park, um, he's one of her chaperones. She's known him since childhood. And the man she chooses to dance with is a doppelganger for Philip. He's a young boy who looks just like Philip. Uh, I, I know because I met his uh, his daughter many years later and the photograph of him, it could have been Philip. She wasn't dancing or smooching with, well, she wasn't smooching with this man, but she wasn't dancing with Porchy. And actually, it's very unusual for you to end up physically falling in love with somebody who you've sort of known through that period of your adolescence, if that makes sense, through your childhood. And later on, I'm sure she lent on him as a sort of friend, but when their relationship hots up, then that's when she's actually making the real point of having two more children and, and reaffirming her marriage with Philip in the wake of all the hoo-ha around him and the fallout with Mike Parker. And, and, and the idea that Andrew looks like Porchy, well, Andrew just looks like an aristocrat. You know, they all have that slightly chinless, vaguely gormless look that, that Porchy shares. And that actually Philip doesn't have in quite such a large uh, amount, which is one of the reasons he looks so attractive compared to all the men he was placed alongside. And in fact, the one person that Andrew really looks like is Queen Mary, um, his, his mother's grandmother. So in conclusion is, no, I don't think she, I think she had took immense emotional sustenance from Porchy because I think Philip was quite a lonely man, quite a brusque, lonely man to be married to. But I mean, this isn't a woman who's emotionally or physically messy. She doesn't even hug her grandson, for goodness sake. Um, so I'm absolutely convinced. But even the idea of positing the question, you know, on the click, on the thumbnail, did the Queen have an affair? I just think, is that worth my head? Well, you just have done. So that's, uh, you yeah. know, we now have <laughs> at, at, at some length your explanation of why the Queen didn't have an affair. So, so I, I have a so question for both of you then. We've been clipped that out and use it. I have a question for both of you as royal historians is that in that if you are um, lifting the lid on, on certain um, behaviours, events, actions that would undermine the institution of of uh, the monarchy that could if it's particularly explosive increase the interest in republicanism and then we get a real debate and the institution of monarchy is at risk you know obviously as a historian you'd love that because you'd get lots of sales however we're talking about serious issues here and you know this is the constitution of the united kingdom would that not be a, um, uh, often in family problems, it's responsible thing is to li let do sleeping dogs lie. What do you think about that? Um, well, I mean, my own feeling is that republicanism doesn't have a champion. And that I think that in order for any kind of serious Republican movement to exist in Britain, you would have to have somebody, a very high profile figure. I mean, I, I hate to say his name because I think he's a bit overexposed, but someone like Gary Lineker, if he was to stand up and actually say, come on, the royal family have had their time. Let's have a new movement in this country. Let's move away from these old things. Let's, you know strap out strap you know get rid of the civil list let's make sure that we don't have this ancient hidebound ad adherence to an old-fashioned value now i mean i think linick is quite a sort of controversial figure so perhaps he doesn't have a level of public support you would need but i'm saying that somebody if somebody came forward and actually said this who had a platform and was listened to it would get very interesting because nobody said it i mean there are republican movements in this country but they're small i mean there's no actual interest or desire for it so isn't you really there's too much because there's too much establishment vested interest in backing the monarchy i know that as someone i'm a monarchist light i'm not even anti-monarchy but the level of trolling i get is quite dark actually like it's impacted Who on from? my ability to get work else elsewhere and and i think that that is a it, it is an example of why you just wouldn't touch the subject you know even gary lineker wouldn't go near that one but just yeah. if we can just really quickly go back to wallace simpson because i i find her eminently fascinating you know she she's obviously attracted to the duke of windsor because he's part of the royal family he's a big fish and then he loses his scales effectively by marrying her 
they're in no man's land at the beginning of the war. Does, I mean, how does she manage to hold it together and stay married to him? I, I'm really intrigued by that. And the dynamic in the Bahamas and then afterwards, what did you discover around that area? Well, what was unfortunate, and you mentioned this in your very kind review of my book in The Spectator, is that my book is a book where the men get most of the airtime mm. and the women... I mean, Queen Elizabeth gets, I think, more attention than Wallace because we just have more material, we have more letters. The trouble is, is that what we want to know in the Second World War is the relationship between Wallace and Edward. And we have mm. no letters, we have no diaries, we have no actual information, apart from her letters to her aunt, where we can know what's going on in her head. Because, to me, the most terrifying line I've ever written apart from stuff about Byron and his daughter, is a moment in Crowning Crisis when Wallace has gone to France and Edward is essentially chasing her. And he says to her, of course, you can go anywhere you want. You can go to Newfoundland or the South China Seas, but wherever you go, I will find you. And you think, oh, that's absolutely terrifying. I mean, that is something that you, you see, and it's just every time I even think about that, the chills go up the back of my neck. And you think, that's not romantic. That is essentially a man saying, I will stalking. track you down to the end of your life. Yeah. 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 But stalking at that sort of level, the fact that she'll never be free of him, that she'll never be able to escape. When did he write that? When was that letter written? That was during the abdication crisis. I, I, I don't think it was a letter. I think it was, it was a conversation on the phone. But you think to yourself, God. okay, that's... But this was presented as if it was a, an undying romantic gesture. But you think, that shows what his attitude towards romance was. It wasn't love. It was about capture. It was about owning. And that was, I think, what their relationship was. Because, yes, I mean, I think she held most of the cards in terms of she was the dominant one, she was in charge. But, of course, he, he was a man who'd been king. And how do you get away from a man like that? Just going back to then uh, the royal family's flirtations i suppose with the national socialists in germany because i don't think it was only the duke and duchess of windsor who had not necessarily they certainly didn't uh, the others didn't meet but there were i think in your book you 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 show there is an event in the early 30s where a nazi salute is given by members of the royal family and so does that betray any other Nazi flirtations beyond Duke, the Duke and Duchess? <laughs> no comment. <laughs> um, seriously, it's, it's one of those things that I think it's very, very difficult to talk about the royal family and talk about their own Nazi sympathies. It is a matter of record, as I say in the book, that a lot of the very high-profile courtiers were people who had Nazi sympathies, and one of them wrote to George VI and said, essentially, you've got to make peace with Hitler, otherwise it's going to be the worse for you. I think what's very clear from all the letters and all the diaries that I found is that George VI himself was an absolutely paid-up anti-fascist. He was somebody who could see that Hitler was rotten, and I think to his immense credit, he stood shoulder by shoulder with Churchill. Whether that was the same for everybody else around him, I couldn't say. In fact, the, what's interesting about the war is it, is it made the royal family after it had been knocked off course by the Duke of Windsor. Um, and what's fascinating is that actually it's a bit like what would reunite Britain beyond the sort of respective nationalisms of, of Scotland and, and Northern Ireland. Uh, and what would sort of uh, turn Harry into a genuine baddie, not just a sort of benign problem. Um, not benign, but sort of... you know. Or you know what I mean? I that's sort of, like you a, know, a, a benign tumour, perhaps. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that's too unfair. I can't have a degree of sympathy for Harry, but he's he's. It's not black and white, is it? Who's the goody and the baddie exactly? But actually, you think, gosh, only sort of really global conflict on a sort of World War Two level could could ever redraw the British narrative and the royal family narrative in that way. I can't see what what else would have really in that way saved the Windsors. No, because actually, if you look at George VI, I mean, between the abdication crisis and the outbreak of war, he's a very pathetic figure. Yeah. And it's what, what's, I think, very interesting is I hope that people read The Winds of War and end the book liking and respecting George VI and, if you will, the journey he's been on is a significant one. But he found his mettle in war because before that, I mean, he had these years where he, was, he didn't want to be king and he didn't do anything of any worth as king. 
and people were trying to pretend he was doing a decent job, but he obviously wasn't. No, but then, that's pitiful. Uh, w- precisely. I mean, war revitalised him. It actually gave him... I mean, he was standing up, making these impromptu speeches, completely without notes, because he actually understood what his role was. And I think that's fascinating. Mm. It just goes back to what you say. But that level of adversity, the, the level of difficulty that people faced, brings out the best of the worst in people alike. Yeah, it was like the Queen's kind of great moment in COVID, wasn't she? We'll, we'll, we'll meet again. Yeah. You know, she kind of went out with a bang because of the pandemic, bizarrely, and also her great age and, and 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 her tying us physically back to the Blitz, back to that moment when her family came of age and kind of ran away from the shadow of the Duke of Windsor, which, by the way, is why Charles didn't meet Harry when he clearly had a free day because he'd just been cancelled in France before he went to Germany because he needs to keep away from that kind of so, a soap opera quagmire and become the statesman, you know, with our ally Germany, you know, and and it was a lot of their, that sort of trip was about reaffirming the British alliance with Germany in the face of Ukraine and Russia. I think it's really interesting. It just doesn't work on the same level anymore. That's the problem. Well, I'm watching Succession at the moment, and I think there's an awful lot of parallels between the relationship between the patriarch, Logan Roy, and his disappointing children, and between King Charles and Harry. There's a lot Mm. of... Because what we don't know is there's a lot of friends of Harry who brief the papers on a daily basis, and you think, it must be quite a demanding job being a friend of Harry. I mean, you have to have, you know, endless amounts of phone calls with endless editors, but pretty much constantly. But the fact is, is, I mean, it's the 4th of April today. We don't know if Harry's going to attend the coronation in just over a month. Mm. I have put, you know, my slender reputation as saying he will attend the coronation because I think that if he if he didn't attend the coronation unless there's some last minute reason of illness or something else invented it would be seen as the final severance of any kind of relationship between him and the rest of his family Mm. and I think does does he want that I mean does he actually want to cut himself off forever I don't think he does you can't come to a delay is a petulant thing from Harry isn't it just to show oh I'm going to accept it but I'm going to wait to the last possible moment I'm going to make them sweat but the fact mm. is, is that it just shows the weakness of King Charles's position. Because if he was in a strong position, he'd just say, right, don't come. But the thing is, he knows that if he didn't invite his son, his reign is beginning, his proper reign is beginning with this cloud hanging over it. And it's a depressing thing because we have this thing in, in the monarchy that we have the significant reigns and we have the insignificant ones after. I mean, for instance, you look at Elizabeth's reign, that's a significant reign. You look at George V's reign, that's a significant reign. Victoria's reign. Then you look at, say, Edward VII, that's not a significant reign. And King Charles probably won't be a significant reign either. So you think to yourself, how depressing must it be to know that history is going to regard you as the epilogue and nothing else? I would challenge you on Edward VII. I thought he was one of our better monarchs. He just didn't have very long on the throne because like Charles, he was an old man. It's also about how quickly you get in on the act. Elizabeth was hugely lucky. She was peaches and cream. She was young. You're very kind. I picked up on my spectator review that I did of your book, just to end on a positive note. I called it fascinating and detailed, but I did criticise your idea that the Queen had somehow solved the problem of the Duke of Windsor, because I still don't think the Windsors understand what to do with with tricky outsiders, whether it's Diana Um, or or indeed Harry. I think it's one of their great problems is their lack of flexibility. And I think that Elizabeth reinforced that. It started with the Duke of Windsor. He compounds it by flirting with the Nazis and being, you know, extradited effectively to the, where was it, the Bahamas, as you so delicately write about in your book. But then actually there's no revamping of the model. There's no more sympathetic version of how to get a more flexible monarchy going. But this brings us back to the idea, I mean, you mentioned Diana, do you think she was actually trying to destroy the monarchy? More so than Harry, more so for Duke of Windsor. Ollie, what do you think? As a neutral bystander. See, the problem is, during that period in the 90s, I completely ignored the royal family. I was too busy having fun at university to pay attention to the royal family. So um, I, um, I don't know. Because I don't believe that Harry or the Duke of Windsor have ever actually wanted to destroy the institution of the monarchy. I think that Harry sees the people in it as very flawed. And I think he sees the idea of the monarchy as being something that traps him and his family. I don't think he actually wants to see republicanism any more than Duke of Windsor did. Uh, in answer to your question, nor did Diana. They're all to the manner born. If you'll remember in that famous interview that's now been totally discredited, um, 
she actually says, you know, she doesn't think Charles is going to be a fit king, but she's heavily touting her son William to become king. So it's so, you know, it's it's just about individuals. It's about the soap opera beneath the canopy, but none of them are kicking at the canopy, although they make it shake a bit. They're having their tussles, their soap operas with respective individuals. But and she still wants to be Queen of Hearts. I mean, she's not even giving up on the title fully, is she, Diana? I mean, she she, she lacks intellect, but what she lacks in intellect, she made up for with this extraordinary charisma that even the Duke of Windsor had to an extent. I mean, people missed him in Britain. They missed his sort oh, yeah. of magic fairy dust, didn't they? It was one of the problems. This clunking king, George the Sixth, had it not been for the prospect of a jackboot arriving in Britain, would we have ever learnt to fall in love with one of the potentially dullest men on the planet? But then I think what happened after the Second World War is that, I mean, the reason why my next book is, 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 is made me cry writing it constantly, is that essentially it is watching somebody's death in slow motion. And that's a horrible thing to write about, because ultimately you see not just his illness, but you see the way that what he had of the Second World War slipped away. And it's a horrible thing to consider, really, the idea that you have this moment where you can be successful and you can be charismatic, and then it comes to an end, and you're you know, your residual nature comes out again. And I find it fascinating because ultimately there has not been, as you say, somebody in the royal family who has taken it as an institution and tries to undermine it, has tried to bring it down. But the Duke of Windsor, I think, did great damage to it, I mean, both when he was king and afterwards. And you have to ask, what were his motives ultimately? Was it just that he was stupid and selfish? Or was it more sinister? And then I th- just wanted to end it with, have we, we've seen the institution of monarchy strengthened by queen elizabeth's death i think you know that her lying in state has has strengthened the institution if we look over the pond and see uh, the change of head of state from trump to biden was met with a bit of violence that certainly undermined the head of state in america that those scenes uh, t- going towards the capital in this country we saw a change of head of state and change of prime minister with very little um, very little uh, argy bargy. So we're presumably in in quite a strong state today. I, I wouldn't go that far. I mean, we're a country no. that's in massive massive decline, and I think that the reason why we didn't have any processes is that we're utterly utterly depressed as a country. I mean, we spend our days staring at mobile phones and fighting with strangers on social media. We don't have the energy to do anything in real life anymore. I mean, you look at America and you look at Trump and you look at Republicans. Now, I mean. I don't know if anyone's going to be listening to us who's a, who's a, a Republican who would support Trump. I mean, they're welcome to buy my books just as everyone else is, so I shan't insult them. But you can see that at least they're fired up about something. I mean, at least they genuinely believe in the idea of Trump and Republicanism. As in this country, I mean, after dear Jeremy Corbyn, there hasn't really been anyone who people have actually worked up about one way or the other. I mean, Boris Johnson was a prime minister who, okay, there was the people who supported him because, oh, Boris. But now you just, you, you can't get excited. I mean, you look at Rishi Sunak, you look at Keir Starmer. These are not people you can care about either way. They're just people who, they're these dull people who don't really have any charisma. And I think that's what we deserve as a country. We are, as John Major put it, we are not a first division country anymore. We are a top second division country. We have to accept that. I mean, we have to accept that the glory days of the Second World War and of Churchill and of Britain standing alone, true or untrue as it might have been, are long since behind us. We're just not a world power. And on that depressing note... um... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I think that's fine. It is actually. I've got to say, my own USA publication day today. Alex. Congratulations, Elizabeth Tessa. and Philip is out in America. Didn't you know? I don't know if they've fully woken up yet. But um, in my narrative, in the 1940s and 50s, we're still a world power. I'll just have you know, <laughs> in my little head as well. <laughs> Alex, thanks very much for joining. Olive, Tessa, absolute pleasure. Thanks very much for listening. Please do rate and review. Links to the Windsors at War are in the show notes, as well as links to Tessa, Alex and myself. You can get hold of us via the Twitter. Plenty more great content coming up, including me out recording in the field, Flanders Field, for a World War I special. But until then, thank you and good night.